Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Now that August is pretty much over, today we're looking in review at the top figures that have come out for that month. Many beautiful figures were initially scheduled for an August release, but ended up getting delayed into the later months, so the list has changed around quite a few times, but now that we're at the end, we can look back and see what's left and decide which of the figures deserve a spotlight on this list. Initially, I had 15 spots because it's nice to get a variety of figures, but so many honestly got delayed I only have 10 to show off today, but I think that's going to be more than enough. And finally, as usual, it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, this list is entirely my personal opinion based on my personal preference, so feel free to agree or disagree and leave any thoughts in the comments. Now that that's out of the way, let's move on to the list. Number 10. Rainbow Dash made by Kotobukiya from My Little Pony. This is a first for me. I honestly never thought I'd be talking about a My Little Pony figure unironically on this channel. But how can I not? My Little Pony is the latest franchise to get the Bishoujo experience with veteran concept artist and my personal favourite, Yamashita Shunya, providing the transformation from horse into Bishoujo. It has been a long time tradition in the My Little Pony community for fans to sketch the ponies as what they think they'd look like in human form, with some results faring better than others. Most of them are just terrifying. But I never would have pictured me actually admiring the transformation so much as I do here with these six figures. I love them. I even love that they have their little horse form next to their human form. I have never understood the brony aka male pony fan as much as I do now. Yamashita Shunya has magic in his hands. You can see how carefully he's crafted each figure to make sure they visually represent the traits and personalities of these tiny ponies. Rainbow Dash is the fifth release of the six, and because of their success, three more ponies have been announced, and I welcome each of them. Number 9. UMP9, made by Funny Nights from Girls Frontline. UMP9 stands for Universal Masculine Pistol 9mm Parabellum. Quite a mouthful of what I can only describe as made up words mashed together to create a title. I feel like I have to explain here. So you know how in some anime or probably more commonly Chinese mobile games, some companies like to take a very specific real life combat object, say a battleship for example, find out all the statistics and information they can, then create a detailed and historically accurate representation, and then turn that into an anime girl. Huh? That's pretty much what is happening here, only instead of ships, in Girls Frontline each character is modelled off a pre-existing or currently existing firearm. I know, it's pretty weird, but apparently there's a lot of fans in Asia who just love military hardware because Girls Frontline's largest playing countries are China, Japan and South Korea. The game is a gacha collectathon, which is not my type of thing, but I can still appreciate a nice figure when I see it. I do find it interesting that the majority of Girls Frontline figures including this one, are being produced by Japanese companies. With the IP already being Chinese, I would have thought it to be the perfect franchise for Chinese companies to latch onto, especially because similar figures have been released by companies like Damn Toys and Mythos already. But then I found out Hobby Max has like 10 already released or in the work, so that kind of makes up for all the other companies. Number 8. Darkness from the Konosuba movie Legend of Crimson, made by B. Fool. Konosuba is freaking hilarious, and Darkness is one masochistic lady. She enjoys the finer things in life, like, I don't know, being captured, tortured, beaten, extorted, taken advantage of. Out of pureness, and definitely not carnal desire, I do have a curiosity about the history of masochism in female anime characters. Aside from hentai, I think it's more common in males. Like, I honestly do. The whole tsundere or maybe even kamidere character with the foot on the kneeling male, that image sticks out to me far more than anything I've seen in reverse. But darkness is a little bit more extreme. I'd even go as far as to say Darkness is an outlier, just in terms of regular anime, nothing Edo whatsoever. However, given that Konosuba is a massively self-aware parody of overused tropes in anime, manga and video games, it's possible that La Latina's masochistic nature is also a massive parody of Edo gaze or hentai. 
or perhaps even roles in reverse, I don't know. Regardless, not many figures of darkness really get me going and it comes down to I just don't really enjoy her regular outfit in the anime. The other girls, I love their outfits. They're a nice mix between fantasy and modern fashion, but darkness is so overburdened and overcovered by unfitting armor, I just don't like how she looks. Now again, it's probably a deliberate play on the creator's part because being that she's the character with the looter's thoughts internally, externally it fits the paradox that her body should be covered holier than thou in clothing, but it just doesn't look right. It's not because she needs to be wearing scantily clad bikini armor, it's more so this outfit just does nothing for her image. She's supposed to be a noble crusader, even if she's terrible at swordplay, the other girls at least have the look, but she doesn't even have that in my opinion. Take away her weapon and would you even think she's a swordsman? I wouldn't. I'd expect her to wield a wand or a staff as a mage because of her robes. No, something needs to be done. We need to call in a professional. Okay, it's fashion makeover time. I'm the host with the most. Let's see what we got. Uh... Oh no, darling, this is just wrong. Everything's classing. Look at these baggy robes. Appalling. I spit at you. These black undergarments, they stick my eyes. Putrid, clashing with the orange. No, unacceptable. Something must be done. Brainstorm. Mm, I'm just going to throw an image out there. Out into the wild of how I think the outfit should look. Yes, the hair, the face, everything else is fine. Just put them together, change the outfit, keep the bow. I like the bow. Here it is. Obviously, change the color, remove the cross, swap out the shield for her two-handed weapon. We're flexible, it's fine, darling. Even put pants on, I don't care. At least it's fitting, at least it's slim. Mm, with separation, not this baggy potato sack you put in the wear. <sighs> Someone, Photoshop darkness into this outfit. Where's my assistant? Fabrice! Okay, that's all for me. Go to Birdo. See you next time, darlings. Bye. So obviously I like this golden bikini figure because anything is better than her outfit in the show. And in typical B4 fashion, this figure is available with a clear hair version as well as a normal one. Number seven, Red Sonya made by Prime One Studio from Red Sonya. Although I definitely talk less about Western figures and lean more towards the Japanese anime style, that doesn't mean I don't enjoy some of what the West has to offer, especially from the upper tier companies like Sideshow Collectibles. This figure is from the upper tier Japanese company Prime One Studio, who you probably know for making massive scale figures with quite hefty price tags. But Prime One Studio often uses Western sources for their figures, which results in amazing works like this. Red Sonja is a long-running sword and sorcery comic book that was originally created under Marvel's publication but has since moved hands several times. Although Sonja never really hit mainstream, she definitely has a cult following. However, more people are probably aware of her previous sometimes ally Conan the Barbarian, as at one point they existed in the same universe. Sonja is the combination of a striking beauty with blazing red hair but also a fierce fighter. It's definitely evident that she's a product of her time. I mean, she's literally wearing a chainmail bikini, which I don't know if that would be the logical choice for overall bodily protection against the giant serpent, but it looks pretty damn awesome. This figure also comes with a few interchangeable parts, including a great sword and a battle axe, as well as an amazing cape and faux fur, which can be put around her boots. Number six, black and regular Hanakawa Tsubasa made by Union Creative International Limited from Nekomonogatari Black. Most people who've seen it agree there's really no other series quite like the Monogatari series. Though I have heard it's become a little more watered down in recent years, I haven't seen up to the current entries, but from what I have seen, I do know one thing. Hanakawa was never best girl. Still, this is probably one of the nicest figures of her, and you get both versions of her character, so it's a win-win. I never really liked her black version in the pajamas. She looks so much better in a dress. For this figure, they've given her a much nicer color palette. Now, you could look at her and be like, she literally only has one color, but look closer. She has violet gradients in her hair, whereas the older figures use much more gray overall, and this one definitely looks nicer. She has a simplistic pale glow. It creates a nice juxtaposition to her regular version. It's kind of like light and dark. 
saturated versus pale. Either figure on their own would be really nice, but the fact that both come together to form Hanakawa's opposite personalities is awesome, and I think for any major Monogatari fans, this is a great figure. Number 5. Matsumoto Erina, made by Union Creative International Limited from Erina. This figure is part of a growing trend and I freaking love it. No, I'm not talking about lewdness in certain figures, that just happens to coincide. What I am talking about is more figures getting adapted from works outside of high profile anime and manga, i.e. doujinshi. I personally am a massive enthusiast of fan arts and fan comics from all over the world, not just Japan, and also original concepts. There's some amazing artists out there, some lewd, but some not self-publishing their works online or in very small print quantities and many of them don't get a lot of exposure. There's also an abundance of garbage out there associated with fan art or doujinshi works and let's face it, there's some pretty weird shit. So it's not always easy for these artists to get recognised. I feel like the good stuff doesn't really get remembered. Some of my favourite art in video games, comics and just in general comes from indie artists and I think it's important to reward ability, especially for work on such an independent, self-sufficient level. Now with that said, I haven't read this particular work so I don't know whether it's quality or not, but I think it's noteworthy to mention this figure was released by the same company making the previous Hanakawa figure and if you compare each is level of exposure to one another, I'm glad companies are seeing doujinshi and indie artists as a viable source for figures and not just going off what's big or what's popular and what's been done before. I think that option is great for everyone, it creates more choice, more freedom and more opportunities. Just because an artist is backed by a bigger company and budget and even enjoyed by the majority doesn't necessarily mean they're better an artist than one that chooses to be self-sufficient and less people have heard of. And I think that's true for everything. Again, I'm not saying that's the case here, frankly I just like this figure because she's taking a selfie with her top undone, but I think it's an important message nonetheless. Number 4, Koga Yuika made by b Fool from Hensuki. Are you willing to fall in love with a pervert as long as she's a cutie? Yes I am. Oh wait, that was just the title. The series this figure is from is a perfect example of people taking anime too damn seriously. It's about a year old at this point, I think it's just coming out on physical media now, and I'm not gonna lie, before I'd seen it, I was pumped to watch it. Because I knew, it was pretty obvious exactly what it was. How? I read the title, I watched the PV, and I read the description. But apparently, some people didn't. I am baffled by people reviewing this series expecting anything but what it was. The biggest complaints in the mail review section were trash, etchy, etchy trash, and not a realistic harem. <laughs> it's pretty much why I watched it! What did you expect? The second word in the Japanese title is hentai, and harem by definition goes against almost the entire world societal view of consensual relationships. Harems don't exist in the modern world. The series was pandering to a male's fantasy. If people didn't like that idea, I don't get why they watched it. I mean, there was more to it than that, there was a good little mystery, but that's what it was on its most primitive level. And then people criticise it for that. I just don't understand. Anyway, out of the six girls, each one has a, shall we say, hidden hobby they like to indulge in. Yuika's is sadism. She has a master complex and wants Keiki, the male character, to act and do everything exactly as she says without compromise, including wait on her hand and foot, and basically just be her slave, pretty much like every girlfriend ever. <laughs> Number 3, Priscilla, made by Vertex. This figure is an original character created as part of Vertex's elf Mura line, Mura meaning village. And as the title suggests, the figures in this line all consist of various elf girls in different shapes and sizes. The 2D concept illustration for each figure is made by a different artist, and in this figure's case, Asanagi is the concept artist. For those not aware, Asanagi is a fairly prominent doujinshi artist and though he's not my favourite all around artist, he happens to be the author of my absolute favourite doujinshi series, Victim Girls R, which is also getting a figure release. My excitement is over the moon and this is only one of several planned figures from his work catalogue. Now I know his designs aren't going to be for everyone, he paints them pretty thick boy, I'm not going to lie. 
Out of all of the other elf girls, his figure is definitely the most curvy with the most amount of sugar. But I'm all in! <laughs> I really enjoyed his artwork and I'm glad some of his work is getting transitioned into the 3D realm. The regular version of this figure comes with everything you see here, but the limited edition is really where the good stuff's at. The limited version has an alternate faceplate, an alternate hair part, which I actually much prefer to the original, alternate bare feet and legs without the shoes and stockings, and a flocked grass base. So if you were going to go with one, definitely go with the limited edition. Number 2. Maytha Indasto, made by Amakuni from Endro. Last year I talked about the first Endro figure of Yusha coming out, and this is the second of four planned, depicting the mage of the group, Mei. I've talked about how much I respect Grizzly Panda before in this series, and they did the sculpting on both of these figures, which is probably why they turned out so amazing. Each character comes with a class card and a weapon, and these make for the perfect backdrops and accessories for the figures. Usually, I'm not a great rap for characters wearing hats, especially if they're large or poofy. There have been some characters in the past that I really liked, such as Nadako from Bakemonogatari, but literally she was nearly ruined for me because all I could think of was her stupid massive hat when I saw her. Like, that hat is too damn big! Why are you wearing it? It's very possible that she was wearing it because of her curse, I can't really remember, but the point is, usually I don't like the idea of characters wearing oversized hats. But I do make a slight exception for Mei. Her hat does sort of make her look like a blue Toadette from Super Mario Bros, but only slightly. She makes up for it, especially with her beautiful blue hair and gorgeous green eyes. And finally, number one, Urza Scarlet made by Orca Toys from Fairy Tail. I've stated on this channel multiple times before that I like Fairy Tail, but as a figure enthusiast, I've come to the realization there's not a great deal of Fairy Tail figures out there, especially in recent years and especially when compared to some of the other Shonen series it's competed with. Before this figure, there have been 18 or 19, depending on whether you count garage kits or not, released of Urza. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, it's probably a good thing. The thing about all of these Urza figures is that very few of them share her wearing the same outfits or the same armor. There is so much variation in her figures, much like the show, and I think that's amazing. I've criticized companies in the past for releasing figures that are way too similar to other figures that have previously come out, and this goes double for characters that usually wear the same outfit over and over and over again. After a while they're all so similar, but for Urza that doesn't seem to be a problem. Her latest design has her in a bikini and depending on which version you choose she'll come with one of three coloured swords, either a katana or her sword from the Heart Cruise armour in black or regular. These are some of the nicest Urza figures I've seen. I personally like the pink one with the alternate face, but any of them would be fine additions to a fairy tale collection. And that was my video for the top 10 figures released in August. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, apologies, it's a little bit late, but like I said, figures just kept getting delayed after delayed, so the list was changed around quite a few times. Anyway, I'll probably start working on the September list very soon, so look forward to that, and I'll see you guys in the next video on the channel. Until then, bye.